In recent years, individuals concerned with social justice have identified the rapidly rising income uh, of the wealthiest in the country as a serious problem. They claim the low and middle classes are becoming increasingly disadvantaged due to record incomes among the uh, top 1% of earners nationally. Indeed, IRS data suggests that the top 1% of taxpayers accounted for 20% of total pre-tax income in 2008. By contrast, they accounted for only 11% in 1986. Those concerned with income inequality argue further that the gap also affects America's social cohesion. Case in point, broad coalitions consisting of union members, students, and others expressed dissatisfaction with the growing rift last summer at protests organized by the Occupy Wall Street movement. On the other hand, others wonder whether growing income inequality even matters at all. They reject the idea that the gap can be a sign of poor living standards for lower and middle income individuals and families, arguing instead that just because the top 1% are making more doesn't necessarily mean that others are making less and that the middle class is shrinking. The gap, they say, is simply a number that says little about people's improving lifestyles over the decades. Instead of being concerned with how much uh, money the top earners are making, we should rejoice in the mass availability of goods and services unimaginable to people at any point in human history. Furthermore, they argue that data from the IRS and other sources actually overstate the difference between incomes uh, among the top, middle, and bottom, pointing to differences in the way the tax code has changed to account for income. So the question, is income inequality an important issue of social justice that only government can address, or is it an insignificant statistic being used to make redistributionist policies more popular? Um, we'll start. All right, would you like to start? All right, thank you, Eric. Uh, thanks to everybody for staying for the last last talk of the night. Um, I, I think we're not using them. Well. Yeah, they're they're off. All right, so. So, Speak loudly. So uh, I, I should let you know that uh, the answer to this is obviously no. Uh, income inequality is not unjust. Um, so, and I, I don't think Richard is going to take the yes position. So uh, to make this interesting, I, I just wanted to, uh, I just wanted to point out uh, some weaknesses in the uh, conservative or free market approach. Uh, to income inequality or some holes in it. So I'll, I'll, and then maybe that could offer some questions for us to think about uh, tonight. So, so just just to further say no, I think uh, certainly there are remedies to to income inequality. We can have income income compression uh, like they do in Europe and and take the take the remedies that Europeans use to achieve compression. We know what those are. Unionism, protectionism, um, uh, regulation, labor regulation, and I, I think what you find the result of that we know after in in the famous graph in 19 starting in 1969, uh, Europe, the EU had comprised about 36 percent of world GDP. Today it, it now is at 25 percent of or 26 percent of world GDP, and the U.S. has stayed basically constant at about 25 percent of world GDP. Japan has had a similar downward trajectory, and so I think there's a massive cost in in doing income compression uh, like that, um, and that's my fear with uh, democratic proposals to address this. And, and the Occupy movement, uh, that's my fear about them, is that yes, we can achieve that. I think, I think basically what you do is you just cut off all the high standing trees and that's, that's how you, uh, you get to income inequality. And so, so I think, I think uh, Rick Santorum uh, during the debates, I, he's probably not the most popular person in this room, but uh, I think he says a lot of very interesting things about this topic. Uh, and two of them are this. One, he, he quotes some uh, liberal think tank that says, if people would just follow this model, uh, go to school, go to work, get married, then have children, you'd, you'd pretty much solve the, the problem of, uh, of poverty in the United States, if, if people could just solve that. But I think, uh, I think instead, uh, in 2009, for example, 40% of American children were born out of wedlock. 40%, and you know, perhaps it's a coincidence, but also 40% of American uh, Americans didn't graduate from high school. 
40% of, Ameri of American children not graduate from high school. So, so when we look to when we look to uh, free market solutions to this, yes, a free market approach would create uh, we, we our policies would create many more jobs, so people would have uh, plenty of options in the workplace to go to. Uh, we our our workforce would be much more productive, but. But I, I think uh, I think that may be an issue. What what happens with these uh, forty percent of children born out of wedlock, and what besides besides uh, social social pressure, what what can be done to uh, uh, to remedy that problem? Okay, so Shalisha, I have to apologize to you because I think I scared you a little bit when I said I was going to be taking uh, okay. you on for this debate. Because okay. Shalisha and I have actually been talking about this a lot lately, in fact, going back and forth on what you might say for tonight's debate, um, thinking that it might be uh, someone potentially from Occupy Wall Street sitting in my seat uh, tonight. So uh, I had a couple ideas of what I was going to potentially, uh, yeah, let's do some up twinkles. Up twinkles. <laughs> up twinkles. Uh, I had a couple ideas of how I would approach this evening, and originally one of them was uh, going to be very difficult. It was going to be arguing that income inequality is fundamentally unjust, that the number between the highest earning people and the middle earning people and the lower earning people, that number, that gap, is what really matters, and that's something that social uh, policy, government policy, ought to address. And then I was talking with some of my friends here uh, out in the audience this evening, and uh, they alerted me to another answer I might be able to pursue, which is, is income inequality unjust? And the answer is sometimes. Let's think about this. We have a situation in the United States, uh, which has always been uh, rather corporatist in its nature, land grants to railroads, uh, all the way up to what GE uh, benefits from uh, today in terms of alternative energy light bulbs and fighter jets, all of the things in between. It's a question of uh, injustice when income inequality could be brought about by corporatist policy. So let's say, for example, that you've got huge multinational corporations that are operating uh, in the world today. There's a lot of competition for talent, managerial, visionary, whatever. You've got prices or their salaries of those of those people going up and up because you're not only competing with people in your own city, but you're competing with people around the world for very high paying, very high stress, very high value jobs. So you've got a global economy that's driving uh, salaries of the highest people up, but you've also got demand from the U.S. federal government. In a lot of ways, the federal government is the only purchaser of particular goods and services, like fighter jets. And so a lot of what Jack Welsh might have made as uh, CEO of GE uh, has been subsidized by uh, large purchases made by uh, the federal government. But even beyond that, even you know, you can even look at Solyndra. What about the people who were making uh, $2 million a year, uh, the founders of Solyndra, who were benefiting potentially from lucrative contracts and subsidies from the government? You have an income inequality that's perhaps risen there, and there's a gap that's wider there, not because of decisions people have made on the free market based on uh, supply and demand, but rather on the choices of a Congress or a President, whoever finally makes that decision, whether it's uh, you know, maybe a, a czar in an office somewhere. Um, let's also talk about another thing that government can address to, to, uh, to potentially take care of the injustice of current government-induced income inequality, and that's the minimum wage. The minimum wage is something that actually, in a lot of cases, uh, artificially raises unskilled labor uh, costs.